During the interwar years, the future commanders of the German Panzer armies led a strange existence. Respectable professional soldiers like Heinz Guderian were reduced to working in secret. The Treaty of Versailles had totally prohibited the use of tanks in the German army. But with the help of Soviet Russia and the covert assistance of a small team of engineering specialists using disguised agricultural equipment, Guderian and his colleagues managed to keep pace with developments in tank warfare. Despite the difficult conditions, they even managed to develop some new innovations of their own. They could see the advantages that the tank could bring to the next war, and they developed new theories that centered on the use of the tank, theories that would revolutionize the way wars would be fought. Despite the problems of convincing his superiors of the advantages of the tank, Guderian in particular stuck to his secretive task. With determined persistence and the help of some impressive demonstration exercises, he convinced both the German general staff and Adolf Hitler that the tank could help to win future wars. I'm standing here in Bovington Tank Museum in front of the Panzer I, which was one of the main stays of the Panzer Force in 1939. This is a command version, so it's actually slightly higher than the normal Panzer I. But as you can see, it's not the, uh, the great juggernaut of legend. It's a very small machine. In many respects, it's not much larger than, than say, a modern Land Rover. But this was, there were probably 1,500 of these in service in 1939 and in 1940 because there was no alternative. There's no denying that a tank like the Panzer II is a lightweight. The gun, 20 millimeter cannon, wouldn't really do anyone any serious harm. Armour thickness is not particularly brilliant. It's probably as good an example of any of the fact that it's often how a tank is used, or how armour is used collectively, that is far more important than the actual might of the gun or the thickness of the armour. As a result of Guderian's efforts, in 1935 the first Panzer divisions were formed. Every arm had to be presented in the Panzer division to make the Panzer division almost a small army in its own right, not to depend on anybody else. These formations included a tank brigade with 560 tanks to provide the main firepower. The tank brigade was comprised of two tank regiments, each of which was split in turn into two battalions. Two motorised infantry regiments provided close support to the tanks. A reconnaissance battalion was added to scout out enemy positions and seize weak points. A motorised artillery battalion with 48 guns provided artillery support. To provide defence against enemy tanks, an anti-tank battalion was also added. To back up all of this, the division had its own full supply, support and repair system. Guderian realised that uh, tanks and armoured warfare were going to be the future, um, that uh, hard-hitting, fast-moving spearheads of tanks accompanied with infantry uh, and artillery and all the other arms of service uh, would pack uh, a formidable punch. You can really trace this back to two events that took place up on Salisbury Plain in 1928 and 29, which were basically an attempt to test out the armoured warfare theory. What actually happened was that a, a unit known as the Experimental Armoured Force was created. And this armoured force consisted of tank battalions, light tanks for reconnaissance, infantry machine gun carriers, armoured cars for scouting, self-propelled artillery, mechanised engineers in trucks, and even the infantry carried in half-tracks and all supported by the Royal Air Force. And what you ended up with was a small, highly mobile, very, very strong fighting force. Now, in these exercises on the plane, they were pitted against a conventional infantry, mounted cavalry, horse-drawn artillery division, which was huge by comparison. In every single operation, no matter how the umpires cheated, and they did cheat to try and give the traditional arms just a bit of moral support, the armoured element won every single action. And the proof was there and the effect it had was amazing, because in Britain, one or two stuffy old officers actually began to talk about tanks as if they might have a future. The people who took notice and the people who learned were the Germans. They could see that if a highly mobile striking force could be created, not just tanks, not tanks alone, you need intimate artillery support, you need preferably armoured infantry keeping up with you, you need everybody mobile in a package, and you need equally 
immediate air support, hence the Stukas and that kind of thing. And this sort of force sent against a conventional army will go through it like a hot knife through butter. Discover the past with exclusive military history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all on History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to watch everything, from the gripping story of the Band of Brothers to Operation Barbarossa and D-Day. Immerse yourself in the dramatic stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. The heavy tanks would be used as the spearhead to actually punch a hole through the enemy lines and the lighter tanks would be used on the flanks to actually protect them against infantry and artillery attack and maybe other tanks. But the heavy tanks would be used primarily to push the way through and to keep going uh, and to open the, uh, the gap in the enemy defences. A great deal of accurate thought had gone into the development of this type of formation. The resulting Panzer Division was a well-balanced force which could call on the support of any or all of the component parts to capture an objective. The purpose of this organisation was to launch a speedy advance deep into enemy territory and keep going, spreading confusion, fear and panic in the enemy command and communication systems. One further innovation was the close links with the Luftwaffe, which could add even more firepower when needed. The Luftwaffe and the Panzer divisions had intimate links uh, in terms of Luftwaffe staff liaison officers who actually travelled on the ground with the Panzer divisions. This meant that at any time, whenever a Panzer division came up against any particular trouble where it might need air support, there were already uh, radio communications established with the Luftwaffe, which meant that the, the taxi ranks of Stukas and other Luftwaffe bombers could be called into play very, very quickly. And this flexibility and again the rapidity um, of the, the, the calling up of, of air support was vital um, and indeed an intimate part of German Blitzkrieg. The training given to these new Panzer warriors emphasised speed and independence of thought. When these units were unleashed, they offered a very effective weapon that their enemies found impossible to master. In Poland, this new force had the first opportunity to put their meticulous training into practice. The Polish campaign was a triumph for the Wehrmacht and showed the potential for the tank in battle. Nonetheless, some problems were encountered. Because events had moved on far quicker than Hitler would have liked, they had to press these things into service. Uh, they were used in the Polish campaign where their, their weaknesses were very apparent. And certainly by the time of France, it, it was obvious that these machines had to be retired. Interestingly, they were kept in service right through to 1941 and even later because it was simply not possible to produce enough machines in enough quantity to bring them onto the battlefield in the kind of time we're looking for. On the 10th of May, 1940, the tide of Hitler's conquest turned to the west. This time, the Germans will be fighting more modern armies that were equipped with at least equal or sometimes superior equipment. The Maginot Line that stretched along the majority of the French border to the east was bypassed when German panzers advanced through the Ardennes region in Belgium. By a combination of careful planning, surprise and some very daring new innovations, the Germans were able to make these fortifications almost obsolete. Once past here, they advanced all the way to the coast with little in their way to stop them. What had proved impossible in four years of trench warfare during World War I was accomplished in the space of six weeks. The value of the tank in modern warfare was well and truly established. <laughs> 
tanks that helped win these early victories and create a new legend in warfare comprised four main German machines supplemented by two tanks manufactured by the Czech manufacturer Skoda. The Panzer I and the Panzer II were mainly used as reconnaissance vehicles. The Panzer I had a two-man crew, driver and a commander and was armed with two 7.92 machine guns. The Panzer II had a three-man crew and was armed with a 20mm automatic cannon. The Panzer III and the Panzer IV were much larger tanks. They had a five-man crew, which was normally a driver and a gunner in the hull, and then a gunner, commander and loader in the turret. The Panzer III was mainly used as a fighting tank. The Panzer IV was used more as a support tank with its 75mm gun. But the interesting thing is that after the fall of France in 1940, the Americans decided that if the German tank, the Panzer IV, had a 75mm gun, then that would have to be the minimum size of the, of the gun that was used in the Sherman tank. So it was actually the Panzer IV which led to the development of the guns in the, uh, in the American tanks during the Second World War. The first of the new German tanks was the tiny Panzer I. It had its roots in the turretless tractor developed in secret between the wars. It weighed just less than six tons and had a crew of two. Machine guns provided the armament. The main armor protection was provided by 13 mm thick steel. Although its limitations were exposed in Poland, this vehicle was used extensively during the campaign in the West. The Panzer I was designed as little more than an armoured machine gun carrier and as such did not present a great threat to enemy armoured machines. As you can see, it's not a very tall vehicle. I'm not particularly tall when I come up to, to head height on the thing. Um, it's, it's very lightly armoured and very flimsy, but in 1939 this was the kind of vehicle you would face and in 1940, these were the machines that swamped France and took part in that lightning campaign. It was basically a training vehicle. To get used to a tank for the different drivers, they would have to drive the heavier and bigger tanks. And uh, they were quickly built. They had ordinary engines in it, nothing special, and were not very fast either. The Panzer II was designed to run alongside the Panzer I, and provided a tank with armour-piercing capabilities. The first models weighed in at just less than 8 tonnes, with later models increasing their weight to just over 10 tonnes. This vehicle had a crew of three. One MG34 machine gun and one 20mm gun provided the armament. The armour protection ranged from 13mm in the Model A to 30mm in the Model H. The Panzer II was a very reliable tank and had a top speed of 35 miles per hour. Like the Panzer I, this tank was effectively obsolete even at the start of the war. It lacked sufficient armour protection and the 20mm cannon was not effective against the Allied tanks. The Panzer II was to be used as a reconnaissance vehicle but found itself in the thick of the fighting performing the role of a battle tank. The Panzer II is equipped with a 20mm automatic weapon which will pump out rounds at a fairly steady rate. Next to it, a typical German uh, machine gun, MG34, with a very, very high rate of fire. That's it. The other thing I would point out, which I think is, is relevant, is that German tanks, even from the almost the outbreak of war, were a welded construction. And the difference this makes cannot be overemphasised. It means that the tank is integrally much stronger that it doesn't have a subframe to add weight, and in addition to that, it's pretty well watertight. The Panzer III was classed as a medium tank by the Germans, but by the standards of the day, it was still fairly light. The weight of the Panzer III's used in the Western campaigns varied around 20 tonnes. It was crewed by five men. All of the Panzer III's that saw action in the Western campaign of 1940 had a 37 mm cannon as their main armament. This was backed up with three MG-34 machine guns. Two were placed in the turret at each side of the main gun, and the third was situated in the front of the hull. This tank had 30 mm armour protection and a top speed of around 25 miles per hour. However, the main problem was the 37 mm cannon. It was a poor match against the heavier armour of the Allied machines. The decision to fit the early Panzer 3s with the 37mm gun had angered Guderian, 
who had forcefully argued that the Panzer III needed a main armament of at least 50mm calibre if the shells would have any realistic chance of piercing the heavy armour of the British and French tanks of the war. Later Model Gs were fitted with the better 50mm main gun, but were too late for their inclusion in the Western Campaign. The Mark III only came out because the development of what was later known as the Panzer IV took very much longer as anticipated. And so they brought this Panzer III out, which was a smaller version of it in a way, and uh, performed excellently in, in France. But in Ries project it wasn't all that much better than, say, several of the British or even French tanks. In addition to the Panzer III, the German Panzer Division also included an infantry support tank. These early Panzer IVs had the low-velocity, short-muzzle, 75mm main gun. This was backed up with two MG34 machine guns. One was situated in the turret and the other in the front of the hull. Armour protection ranged from 15mm to 30mm. The speed was the same as the Panzer III at 25 miles per hour. This tank was a good design although the versions used in this stage of the war had the low-velocity L24 gun, which was only designed to fire high-explosive shells and lacked the real hitting power which was needed for tank-to-tank -tank contact. Nonetheless, once it was upgraded, it was to become the main battle tank of the German forces throughout the war. This is a, an early war version of the Panzer IV, which was the infantry support tank which was used by the German forces early in the war uh, and through into the desert campaign. You can tell it's the early version by the, the extended commander's cupola up on the top there, which looks almost like a dustbin that's been stuck on the tank. Uh, as you can appreciate, this wasn't a particularly good innovation because in action, it represented a, 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 an easy target and they were frequently ripped off by enemy artillery which left the tank vulnerable, so by 1941 these had begun to disappear. Round at the front we see the 75mm infantry support gun. It wasn't a high velocity gun, so it didn't give it the kind of tank killing power which it needed in the Russian campaign, but certainly for the early desert years it was, it was more than adequate. We can see here the, the thickness of the armour. By this stage in the war, it's about 40 millimetres thick, and it would get progressively thicker as the campaign wore on. One of the ways to uh, upgrade the Panzer IV was to add on extra spaced plates in front, of the, in front of the turret, which gave it a lot of extra strength. Again, some uncompromisingly flat armour at the front here, and as tank design improved over the war years, they soon realised that what you need is sloped armour that deflects shells away from the vehicle. So this was very much a wrong design in tank terms, but those lessons still had to be learned and still had to be assimilated. When the Germans annexed the regions of Bohemia and Moravia in early 1939, they took possession of the main battle tanks of the Czech army at the manufacturing plants. These machines were incorporated into the Germans' existing lineup of tanks. They consisted of two designs. The 35T weighed in at 10 tonnes and had a crew of four. It was armed with a 37mm L40 main gun, which was very accurate, together with two 7.92mm machine guns. The armour protection was 35mm thick, which was very adequate for a light tank. The engine produced a top speed of 25 miles per hour. The second Czech design used by the Germans was the 38T. It weighed less than the 35T at 9.5 tonnes. It also had a crew of four. Its main armament was a 37mm gun backed up with two machine guns. The armour protection was 30mm thick. It had a top speed of 26 miles per hour. Unlike the 35T, this machine was renowned for its reliability and ease of maintenance. These two light tanks made a very valuable addition to the range of tanks already available to the Germans. It has been argued that without these two machines, Germany would have been unable to conduct the offensive in the West. The 35T by 1940 was quite an old tank, um, so it was phased out after 1940. 
but the 38T was a very successful tank used by the Germans very successfully in the fall of France. It was capable of taking on the British Matilda and some of the French vehicles. It was quite a fast, quite well armoured and with a reasonable sized gun on it, being able to cope with the Matilda as I said. It was such a good vehicle that it was still used later on in the war and was developed into other forms of armoured vehicle which later in the war you will see as various self-propelled guns and tank destroyers. The 35T was issued to the 6th Panzer Division, while the 38T was the mainstay of the 7th and 8th Panzer Divisions for the campaign in France. These Czech tanks were involved in the thick of the fighting, as the 7th Panzer Division provided the main thrust for the forthcoming battle. The 38T stayed in German service throughout the war under various guises and finally ended up as the basis for the excellent Hetzer tank destroyer. In the Blitzkrieg of 1940, the 7th Panzer Division, that was Rommel's Panzer Division, was almost entirely equipped with 38Ts and 35Ts. In fact, there was nearly 400 Czech tanks took part in that battle. Now, the Czech tank, the 38T, had actually been offered to the British Army and was actually tested in England in Chertsey in 1938-1939. And the British found it wanting for various reasons. But the Germans were perfectly, perfectly happy to use it, and it was a great success in the uh, Battle for France in 1940. Without the restrictions which have been placed on Germany, the main allied countries of Britain and France had also been engaged in developing their weapons during the 20s and 30s. They did, however, take different routes. The other major nations had not recognised the full potential of the tank, and therefore design and innovation in this aspect were rather more limited. France had relegated the tank to the role of an infantry support weapon. Britain had seen the potential of this new machine and set about developing new designs. Yeah, this is the tank known as the light tank Mark 6B and they are really no more than a tractor reconnaissance vehicle, you might say an armoured car on tracks. The armour thickness is minimal, the average anti-tank rifle would go through it easily. So its job is to keep a low profile, to move about the country rapidly and gather information. They are not, strictly speaking, a fighting machine. It's basically a, a small light tank very similar to the German Panzer I in performance and capabilities. Some people say one of the best things about this vehicle was that we left them all behind in Dunkirk because they were by that time an obsolete design. The Matilda Mark I was designated a light tank and weighed 11 tonnes. It was crewed by two men. The main armament was provided by a Vickers machine gun. Like the Panzer I, this tank was little more than an armoured machine gun carrier. However, unlike the Panzer I, this vehicle had very good armour protection that was 60 millimetres thick. This was double the thickness of the best German tank at the time. It had a very low top speed of 8 miles per hour. The tank's limitations were shown up in the French campaign. Although it protected its crew well, it was no match for the determined German Panzer crews. The one-man turret was a major drawback. Over 140 of these machines were sent to France, but all of them were lost in that campaign. This is an example of a tank built down to a price. It was ordered from Vickers Armstrong in about 1936, and the designer was told, we've got about sort of 15,000 pounds to spend, build us a cheap tank. And the only consideration they put on it was that it must have armour thick enough to resist any known anti-tank gun. The idea was an infantry tank, and the infantry tank in the British sort of ideology of armour was a tank that would move slowly, that the infantry would follow when they're making an assault upon a fixed enemy position. So we're not talking about roaring across country at high speed, we're talking about moving slowly, probably attracting a lot of fire, hence the need to be bulletproof, and just to see the infantry onto their objective. Now this is fine, if the enemy is pre prepared to play ball, if they're going to um, set themselves up in a nice defensive position and allow you to attack, great. If these are going to be used in open country with enemy armour milling about, they are in a very sorry state. And of course that 
is the situation in France in 1940. We've got the Germans on the move all the time, not standing still, not waiting to be attacked, and therefore these tanks cease to have a, a useful role. The Matilda II was designed to mount a two-man turret and came about after the realisation that the Matilda I could not accommodate this requirement. The Matilda II weighed 27 tonnes and had a crew of four. It was armed with a two-pounder gun backed up with a Vickers machine gun. It was very well protected with 78mm armour thickness. The speed was a maximum 15 miles per hour. This is probably the best known British tank of World War II. This tank performed well and remained in service throughout the war on all fronts. This tank, which is the, the better known of the two Matildas, was the replacement for the little infantry tank Mark I. We wanted a tank that could support the infantry and would therefore travel slowly and be resistant to enemy fire. For that reason, the frontal armour is 80 millimetres thick. This was unheard of at that time. No one had built a tank with armour this strong. So in terms of its ability to survive on the battlefield, immensely high. But it was also equipped with the British two-pounder anti-tank gun, which I think we've already established, probably one of the best anti-tank weapons in the world in 1940. It's interesting to ask yourself why we used an anti-tank gun in a tank that was primarily for infantry support. A lot of people ask that question because they basically believe that a howitzer firing high explosive would have been far more useful on the kind of battlefield they expected to see. The War Office argument was that by equipping the tank with an anti-tank gun, it not only supported the infantry onto their objective, it then moved through the objective, stopped the other side, and held off enemy tank counterattacks. And that was the logic behind it. The Matilda Mark I um, was a, a fairly basic infantry tank, um, with only a, a, a Vickers machine gun as its main armament. But nonetheless, its armour, uh, over 60 millimetres of armour plate, was very impressive for the time. The Matilda Mark II um, was an even more heavily armoured tank with upwards of 80 millimetres of armour plate um, protecting it, but still armed with only uh, a two pounder gun which could only fire uh, armour piercing rounds. Not terribly impressive as an infantry support tank. Nonetheless, given the level of armour protection, uh, both marks of Matilda, uh, really uh, any anti-tank gun of the day, um, had real difficulty in penetrating the armour. Uh, and this meant that the Matildas in 1940 could range about the battlefield uh, with relative immunity uh, against the, the first line of defence, the, the anti-tank gun. The British used a variety of tanks in France in 1940. They had the light tanks like the Vickers Mark VI and Bren gun carriers. They had the infantry tanks, such as the infantry Mark I and II, which was the Matilda I and the Matilda II. And they had the cruiser tanks, which was the cruiser Mark I on the Vickers suspension, and the cruiser Mark IV, which was on the Christie suspension. Mechanically, this is a very, very important tank as far as British tank design is concerned. It features an American suspension system by a maverick inventor, a chap named J. Walter Christie. Christie started designing tanks in the mid-twenties. By 1928, he produced a tank which was putting up some amazing performances. By 1932, he had a tank which would do 60 miles an hour on its tracks. And by taking the tracks off and running it as a wheeled vehicle, he got 120 miles an hour out of it. It was a sort of tank dragster, if you like. Christie, however, was a cussed sort of individual, and he fell out with just about everyone in the US administration, so much so that the Americans built six of his tanks and gave up. The Russians, however, purchased a Christie tank found it was all they required in basic mechanical terms and copied it by the thousand. And it was two British officers visiting the Red Army manoeuvres in about 1935 who saw these tanks, came away amazed and persuaded Lord Nuffield, the Morris Motors chief, to buy a tank off Christie from which we would develop our own design. And really the only Christie feature that we retained in the design of the tank was the suspension. And the key to it is this, large diameter road wheels. Each wheel is on a short sort of swinging arm bearing against an enormous coil spring which is hidden behind this armour. And that allows the wheel a tremendous amount of free movement. You won't find many tanks anywhere with a gap this great between the track and the timwork. And it's to allow the wheels to move. It means you can get terrific speeds out of it. 60 would be ridiculous, be punishing. But this tank could do 30 comfortably. And that really gave the crew a pretty comfortable ride. And it is more important still because in the British way of doing things. We believe tank crews should shoot on the move. It meant that between the wars, 
just down the road from the museum here at Lulworth Camp, they trained firing on the move against moving targets and reached standards that were absolutely exceptional for their day. But remember, this is a small trained army of highly motivated professionals. Now you take our A13 cruiser. The gun is in free elevation. It literally just waves up and down inside the tank. But what it means is that the gunner becomes the stabiliser. And it means that he's standing in a sort of half crouch position inside the turret. He's got one hand on the trigger of the gun, he's got his eye pressed up against a telescope, and his other hand on the traversing mechanism here, and it's his knees bouncing up and down, which are the stabiliser for the gun. You can see the problem. A well-trained soldier who was used to the motion of the tank, who had been trained well at Lulworth to shoot on the move at moving targets, would be a prize worth having. But the man who's just come back from the reserve, a territorial army soldier, a new volunteer, you are never going to train him up to those standards in the time allowed. The A9 Mark I cruiser weighed in at 13 tonnes and was crewed by six men. The main firepower was the two-pounder gun, but this time it was backed up with three Vickers machine guns. It was thinly armoured at 14 millimetres, but had a good top speed of 25 miles per hour. Like the cruiser Mark IV, the structural design consisted of many angles that trapped the armour-piercing enemy shells. This, coupled with the thin armour, resulted in many of them being lost in the French campaign. The A9 tank, um, in some respects, showed the sorry state of British tank design in the interwar years. It wasn't that the British couldn't design good tanks, it was more the fact that uh, with budgetary restraints placed on the army um, and, and the fact that the army actually came in third in terms of budget as opposed to the Air Force and the Navy, um, the A9 tank was very much designed uh, on a very tight budget. This meant that it's neither its armour um, nor its engine uh, made it capable of fulfilling a true cruiser function. Um, but nor was it heavily armoured enough, uh, or well armed enough, to act in the, in, in the infantry role. Thus it, it was a, a strange mixture of features um, and really wasn't a terribly impressive design uh, and did not fare terribly well in battle. Well, this is a typical example of muddled thinking in tank design. It's totally transitional. For a start, and the most damning feature of all, are these little turrets. It's in addition to the main turret, which has got the 40mm, the two-pounder gun, and a coaxial machine gun, you've got two tiny turrets flanking the driver's position, each with its own Vickers machine gun. This kind of thing appeared on many tanks built in the late 20s and early 30s. And of course, it has all kinds of problems. For a start, some poor wretch is bottled up in here. The other main problem with the turret is that you cannot increase the armour thickness. Because the way these two turrets are mounted, either side of the driver's cab with virtually no clearance, any thickness increase in the armour will immediately jam them solid. So the 14mm armour to which this was built in the first place is all you're ever going to get. There's other problems. The tank requires a crew of six, so it's labour intensive if you like. Three in the main turret, driver in the cab there, and an individual in each one of these turrets. <laughs> French thinking in tank use was influential in the design of their new machines. Like the British, they had four main designs available at the start of the French campaign. The Char Sommuar S35 was a medium tank weighing 20 tonnes. A crew of three manned it. A 47mm main gun backed up with a 7.5mm machine gun provided the main armament. The armour protection was very good at 55 millimetres. It had a top speed of 25 miles per hour. This tank was more than capable of tackling the enemy and was well designed. In fact, the Germans made use of them in their army after the campaign was over. This is a tank for a medium regiment for fighting other tanks. Therefore, more attention is paid to armour thickness and shape and to fighting capability. Now, unfortunately, the two tanks, the Charbet and the Somua, have the same turret. So you've got exactly the same problem repeated. You've got one man in there who, in addition to commanding the tank, is working the main gun and the coaxial machine gun. The outstanding feature of the Somua, without any doubt, is this use of cast armour. It is said that this was one of the features 
that appealed to the designers in the United States when the Sherman first appeared. And they adopted cast armour for some of the versions of the Sherman tank. And there is some influence here. Mechanically, again, like most French tanks, it's brilliant. The suspension system, that is the springs, is somewhat complicated. And you'll notice that the um, French in particular go to a lot of trouble to hide the suspension, something you won't see later in the war, but they shield it to prevent it being damaged. But in all respects, except its fighting capacity, and that is really more down to manpower and human resources than design, this was a very good tank in its day. The Shah B-1 was the heaviest tank in use by the French, weighing 32 tonnes. It was manned by a crew of four. The main firepower consisted of one 75mm gun situated in the hull. This was backed up with a 47mm gun located in the turret. In addition, there were two 7.5mm machine guns on board also. The armour protection was an excellent 60mm. The speed was limited to 17 miles per hour, the weight being a deciding factor. This was a very good tank, and it gave a good account of itself in the fight against the Germans. The main restrictions were the hull-mounted 75mm gun that could only be fired straight ahead. In addition, although the armour was very thick, the Germans found that this beast could be easily knocked out by a well-placed shell in the ventilation grille. At the start of the French campaign, this was probably the most formidable tank in use. Before the war, it was always regarded as one of the best tanks in the world. But there are one or two features that stand out. Um, in the first place, the main armament, which is a 75mm howitzer, is located here in the hull alongside the driver. And although it will elevate and depress, it has no lateral movement at all. Every millimetre, or degree if you like, of lateral movement is made by swinging the whole tank around. And in a, a tactical sense, that ain't a terribly good idea. The problem is that in order to swing the tank accurately, to get the gun laid as directly on target as you can, required a very sophisticated steering system. This tank has it. It has a hydrostatic steering system, which literally allows the tank to be nudged around a degree at a time. But that means the driver is intimately involved in laying the gun, which you don't have in a turret. Now, the French are an eminently logical race, and they therefore said, fine, if we're going to have the driver lay the gun by traversing the tank, he might just as well do elevation and depression as well. So the driver, using his right hand and using a little hand wheel, winds the gun up and down. They then take that logic to its ultimate length and say, right, he's aimed the tank, he's elevated the gun, he might just as well fire it. So it's the driver's duty in this tank to aim the tank, to get the elevation set and fire the gun, for which reason the sights for the gun are built into his driver's visor. And that is really probably asking a lot of a driver. He's got a loader who's, who's working behind him there, and way at the back of the tank, the radio operator. But the guy you've got to feel sorry for is the fellow up there in the turret. He's the tank's commander. He's got the job of commanding the tank and maintaining orders to the crew. He's got to relay messages to the radio operator. He's got an anti-tank gun to aim, load and fire, and a coaxial machine gun which he's got to aim, load and fire, and clear stoppages in, because machine guns love jamming up. So, in terms of sort of ergonomics, the tank doesn't seem eminently practical. It's quite interesting that if you study the war diaries of the Germans who came into that part of France where they met these things, and they were going to meet a tank which they believed was one of the great leviathans of, of the battlefield, they tend to say that they got remarkably close to the French tanks before they were noticed. Now, you could say that's because everyone in here is so busy they haven't time to notice what's going on outside. I think it's more likely that the vision facilities in the tank are probably not as good as they might be. The Hotchkiss H35 was one of the two light tanks in use by the French. It weighed in at 12 tonnes and had a two-man crew. Like most of the French tanks, the Germans used them after their victory in this campaign. The Renault R35 was another one of the French light tanks. However, the top speed was only 12 miles per hour. On balance, the Allied machines, and particularly the French tanks, outclassed the Germans in armour protection and main armament. The Germans were surprised to find that their 37mm anti-tank gun was ineffective against the thick armour of these tanks. The downfall of the Allied tanks was the way in which they were employed tactically. And the French tanks were probably better than ours. 
and better than the Germans. But they were spread so thinly over the whole length of the French border that when the Germans attacked, there were so few tanks available to counter those attacks that the Germans, with their superior tactics, could just steamroll the through. The French High Command used its armoured forces in support of the infantry units and most of the losses of the French tanks were caused by either Stuka attack, by artillery, by mines or anti-tank guns. There were very few instances when large numbers of French tanks met large numbers of German tanks. This was mainly because the German tanks were in the spearheads and were moving onwards and ever onwards towards the coast. The French tanks were used to attack the flanks of the German armoured spearheads and so most of their opposition was only soft-skinned vehicles or anti-tank guns. The campaign itself was codenamed Operation Yellow. The plan had been devised by von Manstein, but had been credited to Hitler. It was a variation of the Schleifen Plan from World War I. The Schleifen Plan had the objective of drawing the Allies into the Low Countries. They would follow this by swinging through behind the Allies and ending up in Paris, thereby encircling the Allied forces. The plan had just failed in World War I, but the Germans were confident that it would bring them victory this time. However, the plans for Operation Yellow had fallen into the hands of the Allies through an unfortunate accident. This meant that the German staff had to rethink their plan of attack. This time, Manstein envisaged a spoiling attack in the Low Countries, like the original plan. The main change was the direction of the main thrust. It would be delivered through the Ardennes region that was thought to be tank-proof. For the attack, the Germans split their forces into three army groups. Army Group B would advance through Holland and Belgium, thereby providing the bait for the Allies. Army Group A would move through the Ardennes, and they would provide the main thrust. Army Group C would be opposite the Maginot Line and they would keep the French defenders busy. The main thrust had the objective of racing through the enemy positions and on towards the French coast near Boulogne and Calais. The Allies anticipated a rerun of the World War I plan and they distributed their forces accordingly. The bulk of their forces was positioned north in readiness for the attack through the Low Countries they had two further lines of reserves. One of these was positioned in the Ardennes region. The Allies grossly overestimated the tank strength of the Germans and estimated that they had over 7,000 tanks. The reality was that the Germans had just over 2,400 tanks for the attack in the form of the Panzer IV. Over 1,400 of these were no more than armoured machine gun carriers. The Allies had over 3,300 tanks to field against the Germans. In the important areas of main gun and armour protection, the Allied machines outclassed the German tanks. When the attack began, in the early hours of the 10th of May, it caught the Allies by surprise. The Germans made quick gains and good advances. This was helped considerably as the Allied strength was in the north, whereas the bulk of the German strength would smash through the Ardennes further south. The Allied thinking had lulled them into a false sense of security, and they felt confident that they would destroy the Germans easily. Although the Germans lacked superiority in machines, they had been training hard on their new concepts and had tested the coordination of their forces. The concept was fairly simple, but very effective and advanced for the time. A point of impact would be chosen that was small in width. The armor would concentrate on this central point and the weight of firepower would be used to overwhelm the enemy. Once a breach had been made, the rest of the division would rush through the gap and into the rear enemy areas. The tanks would continue in the race deep inside the enemy lines, whilst the infantry and artillery would deal with any pockets of resistance and capture key objectives. The anti-tank gunners would set up a defensive screen to protect the areas already captured. Under this well-coordinated attack, the Allies fell back in confusion and panic. They were still thinking of the last war and were prepared for a defensive battle. The Germans had proved that a rapid, deep advance into the enemy lines provided its own defence. We looked up, there was these German tanks coming down the road. We started moving out 
We didn't know where we were going. We got away from the Germans who were pushing hard and they, they were they were travelling miles every day and catching the British troops up and the troops were on the run. The British troops were running away. There's no doubt they were running away. And uh, the French civilians, when we were going back, they were lying in the road and they, and they, they cheered and they spit at us, you know, the British no good, you know. The most significant advance was made by the 7th Panzer Division, commanded by General Erwin Rommel. His tank force advanced quickly through the lightly defended areas in Belgium. When they ran into heavier defended areas in France, they used their speed, surprise and weight of fire to overwhelm the enemy. This unit became the first to cross the River Meuse. Once across, they continued their advance towards Arras. The 7th Panzer Division was advancing so fast that they were given the unofficial nickname of the Ghost Division. When they advanced further, they came into the area held by a mixed British and French force. The British, who were to the north of the German advance, decided to mount a counter-attack from the direction of Arras. They were under the impression that the French, who were south of the German advance, would also attack. On the 21st of May, the British launched their attack into the flank of the Germans. This was uh, mounted by uh, really uh, a very small force um, of about 60 British infantry tanks um, and a brigade, brigade of, of British infantry. Um, with the uh, constant Stuka dive bombing, the British infantry were actually delayed and this meant that uh, the Matilda tanks, the Mark I's and Mark II's, rolled forwards against Rommel's 7th Panzer Division, more or less unsupported. Nonetheless, given their extremely uh, thick armour, um, the Germans were astonished to find that their anti-tank rounds from their 37mm uh, anti-tank guns simply bounced off these British tanks. And the British tanks were able to roll forwards from Arras, crushing anti-tank guns under their tracks and uh, destroying many uh, German tanks and vehicles of, of Rommel's division. The threat they posed by storming across country in two sort of left and right hooks and attacking this German column was such that Rommel himself left his position with the leading tanks, came rushing back, because obviously if he'd been completely cut off inside France with the Brits and possibly the French across his tail, he would be in serious trouble. So he then called up literally every gun in the area, from anti-aircraft guns, the dreaded 88s, through to field artillery and anti-tank guns, and brought the British attack to a stop by a sort of last-ditch effort with these weapons. And in that role, although it wasn't their chosen role, actually for a few hours they had a bit of glory, a moment or two of glory, and did quite well. The Germans had estimated the attacking Allied force to number hundreds of tanks, when in fact it was considerably less than this. Although the attack was determined, it could not halt the advance of the enemy. It did, however, give the Germans a bloody nose and cause them considerable concern. This attack had showed what could be achieved, if the Allies had been better coordinated. The day before this attack, the Germans had reached the coast. Any coordination that the Allies possessed had been lost. The Germans were close to defeating the enemy in the climax to this stunning campaign. They'd successfully penned the Allies in around Dunkirk. However, after Hitler's famous order to stop the advance, the bulk of the Allies escaped to England. Once this area was secured, the Germans surveyed the mayhem that had been left behind by the retreating Allies. They had been forced to abandon all of their equipment, and the majority of this lay in ruin around the port. The German victory was not yet complete, and the next phase required them to turn south and concentrate on the remaining French and British forces that numbered some 66 divisions. We got down to the docks, and the, the, these German, these uh, Messerschmitts were, were machine gunning all the boats, there were a lot of boats in the dock there. They were machine gunning these boat, these, these people in the boats. And of course a lot of our chaps got killed. But, but when we got on this boat, we had the chance to go on a bigger boat. And we saw this, this Messerschmitt come down, dive bombing, and they put a bomb right down the funnel of this big liner, it was the Lancaster. They killed ever so many troops in there. This part of the advance began on the 5th of June, 1940. Less than three weeks later, the enemy was completely defeated. <laughs> 
The armistice was signed by the leaders of the destroyed French forces in the same railway carriage that they themselves had used at the end of World War I. This was the perfect end to what was almost a perfect victory for Hitler and his new Panzer Army. The German victory had been spectacular and had been a vindication of the Blitzkrieg concept. The part played by the German tanks had been crucial. In the space of six weeks, they destroyed the armies of Holland, Belgium, France and Britain. The confidence of the Germans was at an all-time high. They had complete faith in their men and machines, in particular the tanks that had helped secure the victory. The close support of the Luftwaffe had also been a deciding factor and helped to instill terror upon the fleeing enemy soldiers. Hitler now regarded the war as almost won. New weapons development was restricted after this time due to the strains on the economy, and resources were routed to anti-tank weapons and the cheaper costing assault guns. The deficiencies that were apparent with regards to armour protection and main armament in these early campaigns were to resurface in later campaigns but with greater consequences. With a sense of invincibility fresh in everyone's mind, a complacency and lack of urgency set in. Although Hitler was already looking to undertake the biggest gamble yet, the equipping of the armed forces did not undergo any serious redesign. After the French campaign, uh, Hitler actually demobilised certain sections of the German army. He was not interested in building up uh, his panzer force um, really much further uh, and did not put uh, any real effort into, into designing new vehicles or tanks. Indeed, uh, the infamous Führer order uh, of late 1940, which for, forbade any work on any technical development uh, which would take more than one year to complete, um, really stunted uh, German technical development um, for the next campaign for Operation Barbarossa. Adolf Hitler plunged ahead with the planning for the mighty invasion of the Soviet Union. He was confident that his army would deliver victory once more. The men on the front line would quickly discover just how inadequate their tanks would be against the enemy.